I appreciate the history that uh, Russ gave, and I only get about 10 years of that to tell you about. First of all, I got a question. Before you came to Crystal Lake, before you were long members, or when you were long members of the Christian Church, how many of you knew what College of Missions was? Had you ever heard of it? Before we came to Crystal Yeah, before you came to Crystal Lake or heard of College of Missions up here. Or heard of Had any of you heard about it? That's what I thought. <laughs> uh, how many of you had had missionaries at your church to speak at any time? Okay, so you had that association. Well, I first heard of the College of Missions when I went to Indianapolis to work in 1953. And one of the buildings there, they kept referring to as the College of Missions. And I thought, well, there's no college here. What's going on? It was an office building. But there was attached a huge, big library. And so eventually, I got the history of what was going on. And I learned that it used to be a training center when there was one building in the library at, in Indianapolis for the training school for missionaries. And they had added buildings now, and it became then the United Christian Missionary Society, which you are familiar with. It began the College of Missions actually in 1909 with the gifts of over $100,000 from the women of the church to build in Indianapolis this building that would serve as a missionary training school and the headquarters for the Christian Women's Board of Missions. Now you think of $100,000 back in 1909. Those women haven't let up since. <laughs> They're still raising money and doing projects and programs for the good of the church. Actually, that school closed in 1928 due to the lack of staff and finances. Of course, you know what 1928 was leading up to, after training and sending to the mission field 309 missionaries. And Pat will refer to that a little later on. The College of Missions became inactive at that time, but it still had a valid charter. So with that background, we skip up to 1950s, the early 1950s, when A. Dale Fires, whom some of you may know, and cottage is still up on our hill, uh, neighbors of mine, should be reactivated. The, and there were several needs that were spelled out for the training of new missionaries. They thought that gap, they just didn't have the kind of training that some of our missionaries might need or take advantage of or would uh, make them more adequate to serve on the mission field. So the, some of the things were to provide specific orientation course for the new appointed missionaries. They had had the uh, training and the you know, background to do the missionary work, but what were they actually getting into? Uh, second was to pro provide a refresher course for missionaries on furlough and then to provide specific education in missionary history, purpose, and motivation, particularly from the Christian Church Disciples of Christ background. And so each year in June, in Indianapolis, there was a commissioning service for the missionaries. I don't know how many of you ever attended one of those, but the new missionaries who were going out to the field that year would come to Indianapolis for about a week's time, have a commissioning service, and send them out then to the mission field. But then after Dale Fires got this idea, and the staff of the, you know, the Division of Overseas Ministries, uh, they decided to establish a program to reactivate the College of Missions. And the one article that I read said, through the generosity of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Martin of Grand Rapids, 
Their beautiful and spacious summer home at Crystal Lake was given to the United Christian Missionary Society to house the summer sessions of the College of Missions. Located in the center of Crystal Beach Conference Grounds, Crystal Beach Conference Grounds, it was dedicated as Missions House on July 1, 1956. The dedicatory plaque read, dedicated July 1, 1956, for the training of youth in Christian world service, a conference center for staff meetings, a place of rest and renewal for body, mind, and spirit. I'm sure that the founding fathers of the Crystal Assembly Grounds and the conference grounds did, didn't realize that that was going to happen. Well, my job at that point in Indianapolis was as departmental associate in the Missionary and Selection Training Department. So the office I was in was responsible for the missionaries who came through, wanted to be missionaries, put their applications in, went to the psychologists and psychiatrists and made sure they were fit to serve overseas, and then uh, go through the training and education that they needed. We had, at one point, I had a big board up in my office of 107 possible missionary candidates. And usually about 20 or 25 each year would be sent to the mission field. So, it, because of my job there, when the College of Missions opened, they needed somebody to take care of the paperwork and the secretarial items and all the nitty gritty stuff that goes on running a camp or a school for a couple of weeks. So the first year in 1956, there were two bus loads that came up from Indianapolis, which included the staff, 23 newly appointed missionaries and their families. I remember one of the early staff meetings, we were talking about the staff and the plans for the summer and who would be housed where and who would live where and what the program was going to be. And of course the subject came up of what do we do about the children? You know, when the adults are out at the boathouse in their classes or at mealtime or what, well not mealtime, parents can have them then. <laughs> so what in the in between times, what do we do about the children? And good old Jane said, well, you know, my mother likes children, <laughs> so maybe she would come up and babysit. So I called mother over in central Illinois, and she said, sure, she'd be glad to. So she came to Indianapolis, came up with us, and was the babysitter for the year. And I'll say a little bit more about that, what happened on that one later on. <laughs> But the next two weeks, the missionaries went to classes, as I say, out in the boathouse, enjoyed the lake, anticipated their future living and working overseas, and became a very close-knit group. The administration of mission classes were taught by the staff from Indianapolis in the boathouse classroom. Uh, the group that that came the first year eventually went to the Belgian Congo, India, Latin America, Paraguay, Mexico, Japan. So that group became a, you know, as I say, a cohesive group here, but then scattered out all over the world after they left here. My last year with the College of Missions was 1959, because I was sitting out here on the beach or someplace, and Bob Nelson, who was the administrator for Africa said to me, what, how would you like to go to Africa? I said, well, I hadn't really thought about it, but uh, you know, now that you mention it, it sounds kind of exciting. So by December that year, I found myself in the Belgian Congo, the middle of 19, August 1960, I found myself being kicked out of the Belgian Congo. And coming back, that's a whole nother story. Uh, being evacuated with uh, about 30 of our missionaries and their families because of their independence. 
But, and each year, then, during this college of missions time, a veteran missionary couple was appointed as resident directors of the mission house. And Pat will tell you more about that. And it was decided that when College of Missions was not in session, the facilities would be used for vacation for the Division of Overseas Ministry staff and families, missionaries, and others from missions building in Indianapolis or whoever wanted to come. The rent at that point was $15 a week for a single person, $25 for a couple, and $250 for each child. <laughs> and the College of Missions then was here until, what was it, Pat? 1969. So about a 10, 15-year time they were in the College of Missions house. And then I uh, paddled. See, I'm leaving a lot, Pat, to tell you. Uh, but anyway, just as a personal note here, to show you what the effect of the College of Missions had and the conference ground and Crystal Lake generally, my family, you know, back in the early 30s, 40s, did not take many vacations together. But after my mother had been here, we were, you know, expounding how great this place was and what a nice vacation pop time it would be for the family. So we talked the family into coming up here for a vacation in August 1958. We stayed over in the Birches, the boys on one side and the girls on the other. And my brother Charles, whom some of you know, had, was married and had two children at that time, ages one and three. And his question was, and he's not here so I can say this, he's up on the hill. Uh, what do you do up there? And I said, well, you can go swimming. I don't like to swim. <laughs> you can play on the beach. Well, I don't like to play in the sand. Well, you can sit on the porch and read. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so that was okay. We came up and we had a great time and we dug out some pictures the other day of the kids in 1958 down on the beach and playing around and so forth. In 1961, we came back again. And the, then the question was, by the time we had, Charles and the family had had two years up here, how do you get a place up here? <laughs> <laughs> so in that winter, Roland Huff, that some of you may have known, mm -hmm. had a cottage up on the hill and he came in my office in Indianapolis with a stack of pictures about two inches high. And he said, our kids are grown, we're selling the cottage, I understand you're interested. And I said, well, yes. So we circulated the pictures around and by about January or February, it was 1961, or, yeah, late 61, Charles and I bought our cottage up on the hill. And the result of that is, some 50 years later, we are still sitting on the porch reading books. But he assured me last night it wasn't the same book. <laughs> so if, if you are up on the hill, please stop in. But you see the influence of a place like Crystal Lake to people who, from Indiana, from Illinois, but those associated with the church who have that as, you know, their focus, this is a group of Christian cottagers. And at that point, when we bought the cottage, practically every other cottage was a minister of some sort. And so that, you know, drew us to the place with the people with similar backgrounds, with similar interests, to spend our summers with and enjoy this gorgeous lake. Pat, it's Thank all you. yours. Namaste. 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 Jai. Yes. My parents, Donald and Mary McGavern, were missionaries in India in what was then called the Central Provinces. Now it's Chhattisgarh and it's a somewhat fearsome place it was then too. 
uh, because of the Communist Party that is uh, pretty much in, in power there. Uh, I've been back. It's still a lovely place. I grew up in India and attended Woodstock School, which was founded in the mid-1850s and run by an ecumenical mission board. And that school allowed the children of missionaries and government workers and so on to stay in India rather than being shipped home to be raised by their aunts and uncles or grandparents. Um, there were some 19 different nationalities of students attending Woodstock at that, at my time there. And uh, the United Christian Missionary Society sent out teachers, each one of the, the missionary boards would send out staff so that that was how we were taught. The United Christian Missionary Society in Indianapolis was our home address for all of my growing up years. Mother and Dad came home in 1954 on their scheduled furlough time, and in May 1956, I graduated from Wilbercross High School. Now you know one of my security questions for the internet. <laughs> uh, and they were house parents at the Disciples Divinity House at Yale. In May 1957, at the end of my freshman year of Phil at Phillips University in Eden, Oklahoma, we packed up everything in a four by six trailer and headed for Crystal Lake where mother and dad were to be host and hostess couple for the missions house for that summer. We had, mother and dad had, some 30 years previously, completed the coursework at the College of Missions at Butler University prior to going out to India. Dad was now one of the professors of missions of the reinstated College of Missions, and that summer, we spent the whole summer up here. Classes for the College of Missions, as Jane has indicated, were held out on the wonderful panoramic second story classroom you'll see in that picture of, of the old boathouse. And missionary candidates were not just housed at the College of Missions, but rather at the Lake Shore, which is Brenda and Dick's home now, but it was the old Gerard Cottage. And the bedrooms upstairs at Missions House had uh, a couple of the couples who didn't have kids. And also then the new dorms uh, were divided with, as I recall, just a curtain between sections so that families uh, didn't have a whole lot of privacy. <laughs> Dad taught classes for the College of Missions session and for the rest of the summer, he and mother held the Sunday afternoon mission teas that some of you may remember. They were primarily attended by cottagers because the conferences came in on Sunday afternoon and uh, so they weren't part of the mission teas. But they did speak to the summer camp sessions here at Crystal. How many of you ever heard those mission missionaries at, at their mission teas? Uh, they spoke with the family camps, with CFY, with CWF and Cairo, all about their work in India. And when mother and dad had both died and we were interring their ashes in a wee, tiny, defunct cemetery outside of Lisbon, Ohio, the minister who was there to help us brought along the president of the CWF of that part of Ohio. And she brought along a little elderly lady who said she remembered my father sitting on the communion table telling stories about India. Wow. Um, part of the deal in hosting at College Missions House was that then you could have your family come to vacation. And so my five most of my five siblings and their families came after the College of Missions session, and we had a wonderful time together uh, with the lake, with Sleeping Bear, with everything there is to do up here. My brother and my brother-in-law were not happy with the tiny boat with the less than 18 horsepower motor on it. 
They wanted to aquaplane, which was the water sport of choice that summer, 1957. And so they had seen this kid zipping by with a big boat and outboard motor and water skis and the whole nine yards. And so when one of, in my absence one afternoon, when one of the cottager's daughters came down and asked if I would be interested in going on a blind date, my brother and brother-in-law accepted for me. <laughs> that blind date at the drive-in, still there, resulted in my marrying the love of my life, Scrooge Schaefer. And 57 years later, we are still actively involved in this community, which resulted from the original 1918 settlement of these shores by the then Michigan Missionary Society of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Many of the missionaries and ministers in the post-1850s mission movement were people who were called to bring the gospel to the nations at church conference areas. Mother and I, Dad and I arrived late on our first night at Crystal. It was May. We unloaded and make, made up our beds in the mission's house, and then Dad suggested that we all go for a quick swim to cool off. And cool off. When Dad suggested something, it happened. I was encouraged to jump off the boathouse deck first. You all know just what a shock crystal spring-fed deep waters give even in the depths of summer. May was a real thrill. <laughs> My bedroom was the one in the front of the house. And I recall looking out of those windows at night and watching both the meteor showers and the northern lights. I was encouraged by Dad to learn to play tennis by getting up early in the morning and practicing for an hour on the backboard, Patricia. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm not a tennis player. <laughs> I remember helping Mother load up the car once a week, particularly when the College admission session was in session, with piles of sheets and towels and I think probably some of the laundry for the participants. <laughs> We then had to drive to Traverse City because there wasn't a laundromat anywhere down here. We spent the whole day doing laundry. I also recall driving the country roads to pick the wildflowers that grew beside them so Mother could have lovely flower arrangements in place for the Sunday afternoon missionary teas. And chapel services in the old chapel or tabernacle with its sawdust floor, single-strand electricity with bare bulbs and tippy benches, which if you leaned back too far, you ended up in your neighbor's laps. Wood ferns in pots at the edge of the raised stage and preachers, many of whom were cottagers or related to the disciples' headquarters on Downey Avenue in Indianapolis. I remember the wonderful meals in the old dining hall, and on the website I saw that one of the questions you all are supposed to be able to answer is, where was that old kitchen? <laughs> right over there on the other side of the cottage, uh, and I worked there a little bit that first summer, and then the next summer I was hired to work for the whole summer. I heard some years later that Mrs. Carpenter never again hired a college student. <laughs> I was apparently not as docile as her high school helper. <laughs> Mission's house was built in 1918 after moving the Nelson Cottage, the little cottage that there's a picture there, was already on that site and when uh, the uh, Martins decided to build, that cottage was moved. I didn't find anything about where it was moved to, but that's a piece of history. Uh, the College of Missions program at Butler University, as Jane has said, was reactivated in 1956 and started to hold sessions up here. I researched a bit and found that the Disciples Historical Society, now in Bethany, West Virginia, 
had some records about the College of Missions program. My thanks to Shelley Jacobs, the young archivist there, and her interns for ferreting out these documents. It takes some doing. Mm -hmm. And Jim Martin shared numbers of his family files with us as well, where, where personal letters and copies of the birch bark shed more details. I don't know if Jim is here, but thank you, Jim. The birch bark was the cottage's weekly newsletter, and it was filled with personal and community news. In it, one finds articles about the people who stayed at Missions House, leading the college admissions program, or vacationing. Articles are also found in the local Frankfurt paper. Those are the newspaper uh, columns that you see there. Uh, in the August, August 11th issue, Rotarians here talk on missions. The Frankfurt Rotary Club heard an excellent talk on the work of missionaries of the Disciples of Christ Church, which was given yesterday at the East Shore Hotel. Uh, I don't know where that is by Dr. George Earl Owens, who's a member of the faculty of the College of Missions, now in session at the Christian Assembly on Crystal Lake. He was introduced by, Dr., by Reverend Don Verdun of Grand Rapids, who explained some of the work being done at the two-week session at the Assembly and told the group that the summer session of the College of Missions had been made possible through the generosity of Mr. Albert H. Martin, who has been the leader of the Christian Assembly since its founding. Dr. Owens, in his fine talk, told of the methods used in selecting missionaries, the work they are expected to do, their recompense, etc. The Birch Park, July 13th. The house will be open all summer with Mr. and Mrs. Freeman Redding, resident as host and hostess. From time to time, various missionaries will be coming to relax and rest. Currently, the George Earl Owen family is staying on to rest following the College of Missions. They will be here for the rest of the month. We pray that the beauty and peace of this place will renew these friends in body and spirit. We know that they, they themselves will contribute much to the crystal spirit. Birch Park, 1957. Dr. and Mrs. Don McGavern will be the host and hostess of Missions House for the summer of 57. The McGaverns have served with distinction as missionaries in India, and it will be a privilege to have them spend a summer of their time at home at our assembly grounds. Missionaries went, as do military service people, as do uh, government ambassadors and so on. They go to a country and they're coming from home, right? But for those of us who grew up as children of these people, this wasn't home, that was. And so some interesting reading that you might want to look at sometime is that whole research about third culture kids, because it's said that we never really feel comfortable where our parents say is home. Yeah. Um, okay, a neighbor of Missions House, this is also from Birch Park, a neighbor of Missions House recently wrote, I felt such a spirit radiating from the new Missions House last summer, lives dedicated to the further, furtherance of the kingdom of God and the betterment of humans are not ordinary. We would agree wholeheartedly. The spirit of those who came and went to Missions House permeated our whole fellowship last summer. We look forward with great anticipation to having the McGaverns among us. The records show that there were a number of others who hosted, maintained, and vacationed at Missions House. George Earl Owen, Virgil Sly, Dale Fires, Mr. and Mrs. Roy Miller, Dean Ronald E. Osborne of Christian Theological Seminary, Mr. and Mrs. Pickett, May Yoho Ward, Donald West, and Mr. and Mrs. Kenneth Potee. The College of Missions pro program continued on a yearly or biannual basis in the summer through 1969, when it was invited to become a member of the newly incorporated
Incorporated Foundation for Religious Studies. There was no further information in the minutes about this organization, but my sense is that it was an ecumenical group which allowed a broader base of support for the mission training and work. Jane was able to tell me that it probably was affiliated with the Harvard Kennedy School of Missions. Minutes of the Board of Directors of the College of Missions state that conditions generally on the foreign field are having much to do with limiting the number of missionaries that are being sent out. Similar conditions now prevail as in 1925 when the limitations of funds places rigid limitations on the numbers of missionaries who can be sent out in the United, by the United Society, thus limiting the number of students to be invited to the summer sessions of the College of Missions. It is noted in the minutes of January 19, 1969, that it is recommended that the fellowship hour, those mission teas, would be discontinued while it's quoted, it has provided excellent service in the past. It does not now seem to be relevant to the needs and interests of persons vacationing at Crystal Lake, and therefore it has been determined by the dean to discontinue this facet of the summer program. It's also interesting to see in the minutes of the College Mission Board meetings that the introduction of coho salmon into the Great Lakes with the resultant increase in the building of housing in the area adjacent to these facilities impacted the availability of individuals who could adequately open and close Mission's House and the Boat House. My recollection after some years of being a cottager up here is that if the wind was right, there was, when, what was it? They jumped off the cliffs over in Alberta. Hang line. There was hang line. If the fish were running, your contractor didn't come to the house. So I suspect it was sort of the same thing here. Also, that Dr. Virgil Sly is quoted that the College of Missions was under a moral obligation to continue to use the facilities in Michigan at least until the death of Mr. and Mrs. Albert Martin, the donors of the major port, a part of the facility. The Crystal Commission acquired Missions House, and it has been used for retreats and conferences and as a rental property since that time. A major effort in 1979, coordinated by Janet Miller, renovated the building and for a number of years volunteers from churches in the region who worked on that renovation were given priority in renting for their vacations and family reunions. Area churches too have used the facilities for mission committee retreats. I suggested what a wonderful place to have a, a planning retreat and it continues to be rented upon request through the regional office. The boathouse burned some years ago and I understand that there are questions as to why they weren't able to do at least put a platform on it so that we could still be using it. Concrete is one of the substances that leaches out into the water. And DEQ regulations don't like concrete in lakes. So even with the metal bulk heading, the foundation is slowly going back to nature with a birch tree in the prow mm -hmm. and geese nesting where the boats used to be moored, a continuing landmark on the lake. As we celebrate 100 years of Disciples Conference history, it is important to remember the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The Great Commission continues to call us to spread the gospel, whether it's in our teaching positions, whether it's in our gas stations, whether it's in our 
grocery stores. Mission's House stands in witness to that call. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm the current chairman of the Crystal Beach Cottagers Association. That's a mile long extension, a half mile on either side of this wonderful church camp. Uh, and we have been here actually in spirit and in presence for a hundred years. We haven't been an official association that long as you heard from Russ Fuller. Uh, but we've been here a hundred years and I want to just welcome all of you to your hundred year celebration. We had ours perhaps a year or two early in 2016. Uh, we had a wonderful tent on the beach. We had lots of reminiscing. Uh, Russ Tiller and his wife were nice enough to come. We rekindled old relationships. Lots of the older campers uh, managed to be there. And uh, we had videos and pictures going way back. And for a lot of us, we saw some of the uh, earliest pioneers in a lot of our families. We have a number of third, fourth, and even fifth generation families that have stayed in these cottages since the creation of this wonderful place. Uh, we've been alongside the church here for a hundred years. It's kind of hard to believe that uh, when you think about it. Both organizations have survived. We're into the 21st century now, and it seems like things have been the same all that time. I've been coming here for 71 years. And I, I hope that I can continue to do that for a long time. It's like it stayed the same, but society is changing. Um, the cottagers are changing. The church, certainly, you well know, is go undergoing profound changes. All the churches in this country are. The climate is changing. The lake is really changing. The Great Lakes are undergoing profound changes. And all of our different groups have different responsibilities that we've never had to cope with before. The cottagers are no different than the church going through what you're starting to talk about big time now, about going into the 21st century and modifying and being relevant for the 21st century to keep people coming. We hope that the Crystal Conference Center can continue alongside of us for another hundred years. It's been wonderful. It hasn't always been perfect, but it's something that I really want to see continue. When you have a little piece of paradise that you've grown up with, you, you don't want it to change. Uh, and it's really important for a lot of the families here uh, to maintain that connection. And I have to say, this camp, when you compare it to a lot of church camps that I've seen and been a part of, I have to say you have it all over a cornfield in Iowa or a flatland in Tennessee or a grassland somewhere in the middle of Ohio to put on conventions, family reunions, weddings. This is a gem that you have on this lake. And it's it is one of the greatest lakes in North America. These oligotrophic, clean, clear water lakes are, are uh, a treasure to behold and to maintain. And it's something that's very important for me. I'm on the waterfront, the uh, Watershed Association, and we're doing a lot of new things to keep the lake viable. Uh, I commend you for making the decision to go ahead with a marketing and management company. I'm sure that wasn't an easy one that Russ Tiller and his Crystal Conference Committee have done, but I commend you for making that decision because we all want to see you continue and prosper in the future. I would love to see this camp go to three seasons yeah. and fill out your shoulder seasons of the spring and the fall. Uh, it is underutilized. This is increasingly going to be a really valuable place in the future. And I hope to see it stay in the church's hands. We want you as our neighbor where, that we've always had here. 
we don't want anybody else here. You guys, you guys are nice, you're quiet, you're contemplating, you have nice reunions, and I want to see that continue. So let's look forward to another 200 years. I hope I will be here in spirit, and I hope some of you will be when we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the church and the Cottagers Association. Thank you. So thank you very much. For coming.